usually on a film set, they seem to say like rolling hmm. and then there's a pause and then they say action. I'd like us to do that. All right. Rolling. Right. And action. Tim, I believe because of the Adelaide lockdown at the moment, you'd have... Uh... COVID, you are recording in, are you what, are you recording in one of your daughter's bedrooms or? No, I wasn't able to get permission to record in one of the girls' bedrooms. <laughs> right. Apparently you need to apply to a particular government department and there's a lot of paperwork involved. Anyway, I was met with a lot of resistance okay. to that idea, which, because it would have meant they would be inconvenienced for about an hour. So I'm in my own bedroom, actually. Oh, okay, is... right. <laughs> 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 nice work. Although I am more over my wife's side of the room. You know how you have sort right. of, there's an uneasy, you know, sort of truce about it's a shared area, but there's, you know, <laughs> there are different territories and I am over in more in her territory. In your bedroom, who has the side that is closest to the door? Because apparently that's like, that's the dominant member of the relationship. Oh, that's my wife. Yes. It's yeah, her job right. to stop any intruders. <laughs> it's always been her in different rooms we've swapped sides and we didn't even realize we've done it but as we've moved which is i think maybe four times since we've been married maybe four or five mm. she's always been the one closest to the door which i think is about responding to the kids in the middle of the night and i've always been very comfortable with that arrangement <laughs> But it also means I'm often closest to the window, and I like that because I need some fresh air. It's working well. After 20 years, it's working well. I just That's, that's all I've win, got win. to report. Win, win. Yeah. Well done. Now, just to preempt, because we're not doing this at the start of the show, but we want you to hang around, we have some really, really big sofa shop news later in the show. We have, we have a new creation. Massive. New creation, oh. a new object, and uh, I w- I'm doing it at the end of the show, but when I told Tim I was doing it at the end of the show, he said, oh... It should be at the start of the show. Yes. So I'm mentioning it at the start, but it's coming up later. This is massive. This is one of the... I know every time we do something sofa shop related, it's it's um, unprecedented, right? Hmm. Certainly for the sofa shop, it's unprecedented, but unprecedented yeah. for us, for humanity as a whole. But yeah. I'm, I think I'm more excited about this one than, than any of the others. So anyway, stay tuned. Now, as we're recording, the 2020 Olympic Games are happening in Tokyo and the year is 2021. And if you're listening to this sometime in the future, that's going to take some figuring out. But anyway, that's what we've got. Just just in case historians forget to record that there was a pandemic at this particular time <laughs> that delayed major <laughs> events. <laughs> well, maybe there'll be some like, um, you know... Uh, catastrophe that wipes all records from history except episodes of the unmade podcast and and history will be pieced (laughs) together using our podcast in which case the sofa shop will have a greater greater than it should have importance in world history (laughs) tommy ball will take a lot of explaining as well but yeah so anyway the olympics are happening so i've got a mini podcast idea because i how's this for a podcast tim each week you pitch a sport to the ioc that you think should be included in in the olympics no, what, real sports or well, made up sports? This is, you know. Now, well, let me explain, right? Because right, I don't want to go too hard on this because I know it offends some people, and it's also talked about all the time. But I'm not entirely comfortable with all these new sports they keep putting in the Olympics. No, <laughs> like for example, I read this morning because I'm in Britain. There's a big emphasis whenever Britain wins a medal, and they said, "Oh, another gold medal for Britain," and I was like, "Oh, wow, what have they won?" And I clicked on, and it was for mountain biking. Right. So you can ride the bikes in the velodrome on the track there. They have all the Mm. road races on normal bikes. I know they've introduced BMX bikes as well. Mm. Now you can do mountain bike. Where does this stop? Are we going to have unicycles and tricycles? (laughs) Are we going to have penny farthing races? (laughs) Like, like it just seems it just seems to be ever burgeoning, and I think it's for commercial reasons. We've also this year we've got surfing, mm. we've got skateboarding. I've got nothing against these mm. pastimes, but I don't know. It just feels wrong that all these sports keep getting thrown into the Olympics. A, it kind of just feels a bit cheap and commercial, and it kind of also cheapens gold medals. Like, 
there were so many gold medals hand, handed out, like for so mm. many categories in so many sports, and it just like it's just becoming a bit of a joke. They've become like Grammys. <laughs> well, let's not get carried away. But <laughs> and I don't want to start a big debate because. People who love surfing, for example, will be upset and probably think it should be in the Olympics and, you know, whatever. Who am I to decide? I don't like it. I'm just one person. Where do you stand on this, by the way, Tim? Are you happy with all these new sports? No. Look, I'm a little the same. I was watching the opening ceremony when they were doing, um, you know, those blue... Oh, you, Anyway, there was a creative bit where they dressed in blue and acted out some symbols. And when it got to the, the BMX racing and the skateboarding... Let me just add, two pastimes I spent an enormous amount of my childhood doing. So it's not like I don't understand hmm. them or enjoy them hmm. or had enjoyed them as a kid, but they don't seem to fit in the category of the Olympics, do they? They do. And and yeah. here's another thing. they seem It would seem to diminish them. Like I, I know people who surf and love surfing and it's a wonderful pastime, but it doesn't seem to be competitive. Like... And I know there are surfing competitions, of course. But yeah, that would seem yeah. to be against the spirit. Isn't surfing something you're supposed to do to get away from, you know, the rat race and the competitive life? It's yeah. something to get out there and be part of nature. You're so right, Tim. But also, like, it also gets Olympicized. And a really good example of that was the skateboarding. I watched a bit of the skateboarding yesterday because I wanted to see what it was like, and it was still being done in like on like handrails and ramps and all these places where you would get. Ex- where you would expect skateboarding to be done, but it's all like sterile and colourful and yeah, right. non graffitied <laughs> and non rusted, and it looks all kind of like <laughs> like a Disney World skate park. And skateboarding yeah. has this kind of like I don't know, it has a kind of urbanness to it that makes it a bit cool. And when they're doing it, and like they they're skating in like the Olympic uniforms of their country, but made to look all urban with like caps and oversized shirts. But it still looks like it's been designed to match all the other uniforms of the country. And it just looks wrong. It just looks, it yeah. looks really, it looks like a, it looks like a Hollywood depiction of the future <laughs> where they're wearing all these clean, nice uniforms in this nice urban environment, but it's trying to look all cool. It's just wrong. It's like skateboarding in Singapore where there's no, no trash and no graffiti. <laughs> Everything's just absolutely yeah. pristine. Before I make people any angrier, let's put that aside. Instead of condemning all these new sports, my podcast idea is to run with it. And each week you make the case for a sport or a pastime that's not in the Olympics and say why it should be in the Olympics. And it could be a legitimate sport like, you know, cricket or Aussie rules football or, you know, something like that. But I'd also like to see the case being made for a few alternative things like you know maybe cheese rolling uh, <laughs> one of my favorite british pastimes uh, right or like chess chess would be a good one yes also how about this one dog obedience <laughs> and, be- and before you and before you laugh me off the show they give out gold medals for like all these horse things like dressage and yes. all that sort of stuff yes and yes. you're telling me that's not more horse obedience than than humans like those horses cost a fortune. They've been trained for years. They can do it with their eyes closed. The people are just passengers. Do they have horse? There's no horse racing, is there? But there's... Not like horse racing, horse... but they, well, they have like show jumping and trialing yeah, and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that is horse racing. So how come the horses, yeah. it's like you you've don't drop something while you jump over a, what are they called? A hurdle. A um, They've got a particular name. I've forgotten it. Why is that not yeah, in the, the Olympics, but then... There. A horse running as fast as it possibly can isn't in the Olympics. Why don't we have a Formula One Olympic race? <laughs> they should have a Formula One. Right. Like, you know, you have your normal right. Grand Prix season and then every four years there's a one-off Formula One race where they where they have a gold medal. I like the really old Formula Ones where they had to, like, run up to their car and then get in and then drive away. <laughs> I think that's the coolest. Because you could combine two. You've got to run 100 metres and then get in the car and then drive. You know what would be a great episode of my podcast? The one where Tommy Ball Tim comes on and makes the case for Tommy Ball being in the Olympics. Oh, yes. Yes, I can hear Tommy Ball <laughs> Tim getting very... Very excited about it. He, may, he would be tempted into a comeback. I think he'd be opposed to it. I think he'd think Tommy Ball was too big. He would make the case for Olympics being admitted into Tommy Ball. He's a, <laughs> it's a subsection. That's right. 
<laughs> like the NBA players that go and get surgery in their leg ready for the new NBA season rather than going and playing at the Olympics. Like, they, it's just yeah. <laughs> they dare not risk their contract. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. On the walk, we've just come back from a walk. And um, and mm-hmm. on the walk, the idea came up that Rummy King should be included in the Olympics. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if people are familiar with Rummy King or Rummy Cub, as it's mm. sometimes called, but mm. it's a little board game with numbers and pieces and so forth that my parents were absolutely addicted to and that we've been playing. As a <laughs> it was like crack cocaine for your dad. <laughs> they loved it. Yeah, and we've been playing it as a family um, recently and um, it is, it's a great game. I was remembering how much I enjoy it too. Is it in your DNA, Tim? Do you think maybe you're like... A- your dad's being reawakened in you and it's like the, the baton's been handed down and you're going to turn into this old man who plays Remy King every night. Do you know, I was I was playing last night and I was thinking, this is a marvellous way to spend an evening. You know what I mean? Like just <laughs> I had a coffee from my coffee machine and I had just a few nibblies and things and sitting there chatting. Yeah. And, and the great thing is you can play music at the same time and I was playing a lovely crowded house album together alone and I was singing along with that quietly. And I was thinking, yeah. this is it. This is this is contentment itself. This is beautiful. I don't think I'm going to do anything else. I might I might retire. Hang on, hang on. It's not called retiring to play Rummy King. It's called turning professional. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What shoes were you wearing? Please tell me you were wearing slippers. I, <laughs> I had socks on and these Ufos comfy things we wear around the house. So, yeah. yes, pretty nice. <laughs> pretty much the halfway to slippers, I think, is, is, is fair to say. If Rummy King was admitted into the Olympics, would you like, would you double down and go all in and, you know, go for it? Try to make it? I have to say, in the first few minutes of my first match last night, I had the thought, just quietly to myself, geez, I'm good at this. Like, I am going to wipe yeah. the table tonight. <laughs> it's just, it was like, this is going to be over in no time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, things slowed down a little bit. You know, I got a bit stuck. But still, I could just, I could feel it. I could feel it going, I, this is, it was the feeling of competence. Like, I can do this yeah. and, and geez, I can do it well. You don't often have that feeling, do you? No, I can't remember the last time I had that feeling. <laughs> I definitely haven't got it now. <laughs> <laughs> what makes a good Remy King player? Oh, they need to be able to count. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Check. Um, you need to be able to see the colours. So there's four different colours. You need to be identify those colours. Okay. You need to be able to see possibilities. So you go, if I put this one here and that one there, is there a seven that's free somewhere I can do? I can put that. So you need to be able to, a little bit like chess. Yeah. Go down rabbit warrens of possibilities of moves okay. in your head. Okay, yeah, like go steps ahead like a yeah. supercomputer. Yep, very much like a supercomputer. <laughs> is there any element of reading the other players, like, you know, tells and stuff like that? Not really. Um, no. I mean, you can, you know, if they're looking annoyed, it's, you know, they can't find something. If they're looking happy, they, they have. Um, if they're cheering, <laughs> they've won. I mean, it's, 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 it's reasonably right. predictable, you know. If you have, like, incredible, like, uh, memory capacity, like if you've got Rain Man type skills, can you count the pieces and, like, you know, know who has what, you know, by process of elimination? Would someone with that ability have an advantage? Yeah. Yes, you could. You could. The one thing with Rummy King, though, is it's not always how many tiles are left on your um, holder thing. This is a bit like Scrabble for those who don't know it. You know, you've got to get rid of the tiles, you know, out, out, hmm. you know off your little... Um, your rack. You've got to get rid of your tiles. Rack. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. As you can yeah. see, I'm ready to turn professional. I'm across <laughs> all the lingo. <laughs> But it, it, even if you've still yeah. got a lot there, you may be about to put them all down. So it doesn't. I've I've was reassuring one of my co-players last night to you know don't worry if you've still got a lot there because suddenly I've seen people put everything down. Yeah, and it all comes together. We weren't playing for money. I hasten to add, but this was purely for recreation. <laughs> Right. Just in case the tax man or any of the authorities are listening. No, you don't, don't want a police raid smashing down your door. Bit of lock, bit of a bit of lockdown, Rummy King. That's right. That's right. Maybe that's what my daughter was fearful of, not allowing it in her room, knowing that I was probably likely to yeah. spill the beans on some covert rummy king activity. Yeah. I oh, don't worry, I'll I'll cut out all that rummy king stuff. Oh good, okay. 
<laughs> I'll get a text from Tim in a few hours. Hey, man, can you just cut all that Rabbit King stuff up? You know? Just cut. <laughs> This guy just feel like I crossed the line there. Revealed just a little bit too much. <laughs> All right, enough of enough of this shenanigans. I've upset enough people with my talk about sports I want eliminated from the Olympics. Let's have a podcast idea from you, Tim. Oh well, my idea is quite different. I I did r- think of riffing a little bit on the Olympics because it's something that everyone has a bit of an opinion about, but it's actually something quite different that came to mind. I hesitate to to give this idea because I'm not even sure it's a podcast that people will want to listen to, but it's definitely a podcast people will want to go on and share their story on. So hmm. I assume that means there's an audience somewhere, but it it may <laughs> not be. Look, it's called Bargain, and this is a podcast hmm. where you talk about the best bargains you've ever encountered. So yeah, you know. I love it. I love <laughs> you know, it. Don't you think people love sharing about their bargains? I've got these friends who just always seem to get bargains. <laughs> I never get bargains. And every time I go to their house, I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Where'd you get that? And they're like, oh, I got that for a tenner on eBay. They're like Jedis of bargains. <laughs> I'm really jealous of them. They could come on the show every week to talk about their bargains. They're amazing. Are you a good bargain hunter? Mm, instinctively, but I've... I've 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 learnt to ignore that instinct because I know it leads me down rabbit holes of of diminished returns and I just now go mm. and find the thing I want for a reasonable price buy it walk away rather than buying something a little bit compromised or something but if I come across a genuine bargain particularly a double bargain like you know when something's it's like mm. It's 25% of everything hmm. and it was half price that day. Like, you know what I mean? Like a double bargain. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the whole store's got a discount yeah. and then that one was in the, the bin, you know, that was like 10, yeah. you know, that's like a double bargain. That's like a, whoa, that's like two yolks in your egg. And then you shoplifted it. Yeah, and I stole it. So it was like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a really good idea. I mean... I'm struggling to think of one because I'm, as I said, I'm rubbish at getting bargains. I'm that guy who buys everything like at the top of the market. Like I'll buy a house. I bought a house years and years ago, right at the top of the real estate market. And then everything crashed and, you know, it just went down in value (laughs) or like, I'll like, I'll buy like some Apple device. And then the next day, all the prices drop because some new thing is coming out or, you know, I'm just like... (laughs) I'm the worst person. Mm. I'm the person you should ask for advice and whatever I say, don't do. You're like a bargain cooler. You know, in casinos, there are those coolers, you know? Yeah. People that walk up to tables and everyone starts losing and they used to pay them superstitiously to walk around the casino. Yeah. Yeah. You're like a bargain cooler. I'm I'm, I'm shopping kryptonite. (laughs) I remember one bargain... You'll remember this maybe years ago because I think your dad included it in the paper as a little funny snippet. Yeah. I was at a garage sale and I liked the look of a money box, which was sort of shaped like mm. a an English telephone booth, you know, and yeah. telephone box. And I bought it for $2 and I took it home and, and I found $2 inside. <laughs> so <it> was... <laughs> now that is a bargain. <laughs> Nice. Just paid for itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. That's a good but. Nice. There are big bargains in history, though, as well, aren't there? Like, I know, isn't, didn't the United States pay some ridiculously small amount of money for Alaska? Yeah, they bought it off Russia. Yeah, yeah. That's mm. and, and per yeah. square metre or square acre or something like that, it's you know, like the best land deal of all time or something like that. It's a massive yeah, bargain. Yeah, I love that. And I, lo- I, I, I love stories of people buying, you know, crappy old paintings from people's loft at a garage sale for a fiver and it ends up being like a Da Vinci or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I share a love for um, a show on British television, which is also shown here called Antiques Roadshow, which is mm. oh, Fantastic show where people bring antiques and specialists look at them and, and give them, you know, the, and the climax, of course, is yeah. what it's, what's it worth? What's it worth? But And it's really enjoyable to watch It's because it's a calm, lovely English countryside show as well. But yeah. one thing that ruins it, and it ruined it for me years ago, 
is when I went on YouTube and and Googled Antiques Roadshow, you know, highest value ever. And you just get this, yeah. you know, bunch of videos there where it's suddenly like someone walks in with some old desk and suddenly it's worth, you know, a hundred million pounds and it's just like, yeah. oh, oh, and then it suddenly it ruins all the other episodes, which feels so underwhelming, <laughs> like on normal television. No, but those show those ones are what keep people bringing their crap in to get valued because everyone thinks their crappy thing is worth more than it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. Good idea. I'd love to hear from some of the uh, listeners as well what their best bargains are. Go on Reddit or Twitter or email us. Love hearing bargain stories. If you send us some good ones, we might read them out next episode. Speaking of which, it's time for... Spilled of the Week! (laughs) And Tim, before we go to the priceless collection of spoons from the Hein family archive which is, you know, what we're all about. We have started receiving spoons from listeners and we like having a look at them as well. You can go and have a look at links in the show notes or on the screen if you'd like to see the pictures. And today I have a box here. Let me grab it. Opening it here. It's come to our mailbox from Alex and he's written just a very simple note. He just says, few spoons from Ukraine, Alex. And inside I have... Not one, not two, not three, not four, but five spoons from the Ukraine. These are nice. These are good. I would say there are two excellent ones, mm-hmm. one good one, mm-hmm. and two, eh, take it or leave it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. I have a big weakness for spoons which have enamel art in the scoopy bit, in the bowl. Oh, yes. Two of these do. Mm-hmm. And one of them seems to have this artwork of a like a big public square and a big tall monument, something very ceremonial and beautiful. I don't know where it is because Alex included no explanation and there's no English writing on any of these spoons, but it's really lovely. And the other one has, it just looks like a really kind of modern, kind of brutal, crappy mm. building. That reminds me a bit of that bus station one from Brisbane that you featured. I can't quite tell. Yes, I think that maybe that design has gone around the world and inspired a lot of um, (laughs) European European buildings. Yeah, that's interesting. That one's got a bit. Is it got a bit chunk broken out of it, or is it just the way in my photo? The no, it's not. That's just part of the picture. I think that's a roadway or something that has a dark area. Uh, Okay. I also quite like the spoon there. That's in the the box with the red backer. Yeah, it's different to other spoons, isn't it? It's different. I it's like, like that. I, that's my favourite in this collection. Yeah, it's all, like an yeah. Art Deco sort of symbol at the top. Yeah, it's really quite modern. Nice. It's quite, it's quite brutal. I like that one, and the other two, meh, they're okay. <laughs> I mean, they're nice. They're nice, but when compared to the other three, anyway, if you'd like to see Alex's spoons from the Ukraine, there will be pictures in the notes. Uh, but Tim. What have you got? What's like, what spoon have you pulled from the Hein family collection today? Well, if I was ever to go on Antiques Roadshow, of course, my spoon collection, which <laughs> would be what I took, and this would be one that I pulled out uh, reasonably early. This is a beautiful spoon. And look, it's we've come home today because this is just of Adelaide. In fact, it's of Colonel Light. Colonel Light was the Colonel... Not an, he was not an unmade colonel, neither was he no. um, in the same line of work as Colonel Sanders. But Colonel Light no. um, surveyed, um, essentially, Adelaide and, and wrote the design for it. it was, and Light's vision is uh, written there, which is his vision for the city. For, and he planned it out. So it's very neat and square, Adelaide, with wide streets and big gardens and all that kind of stuff. And this is, I think, quite an old spoon. When I say old, I think it's probably from the 60s or 70s, probably the 70s it's got that sort of look to it, which would be one of the earliest times that that mum and dad came over here, probably mum, I would say, on an early trip over here to Adelaide where they used to come on holiday from Victoria. But I I think this has a lovely sort of 70s kind of Adelaide feel to it. What do you think about this spoon, firstly, before I tell you why I, well, I chose it? Well, let it. me explain a bit more for people, because this is this is an area of some expertise for me. <laughs> Toilet break, guys. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel William Lai was the surveyor of Adelaide, and he did this famous grid layout surrounded by parklands that Adelaide is famous for. 
and there's a hill overlooking Adelaide called Montefiore Hill, and on there they have built this statue of Colonel Light, and he's standing very upright, and he has one arm extended, and he's pointing down towards the city that he designed. And that's, the st- that's what the statue is, and that's the statue that's depicted on this spoon. The, the spoon has a, has a picture of the statue. And this is a real landmark of Adelaide. It's one of the three or four most iconic pictures you would see of Adelaide. Colonel Light pointing out over his city. The statue and the, the, the area on the hill is called Light's Vision. And it's also, it's also got the double meaning of this was Colonel Light's vision for the city. And I used to be the Adelaide City Council reporter in my newspaper days. So I covered the sort of the city centre. So I would always be going up to this statue for photo shoots and... It was just, it's just such a big part of Adelaide city centre culture that this statue was a big part of my life. Like, I, I spent, I've spent many, many hours up there. So I have a real fondness for this spoon because it depicts a statue that is a very big part of my professional life. I have all sorts of stories associated with that statue. I could tell for hours. <laughs> so obviously I'm going to be a very big fan of this spoon. It is a good statue. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. It, and it, it sort of points hmm. generally enough that you can sort of say that it's pointing to... Anything in particular that you you would like it to? It's like, oh, he's pointing <laughs> over towards that particular KFC, yeah. or he's pointing to Adelaide Oval, or, or whatnot. <laughs> yeah. He's also buried in the city as well on on Light Square. He is. He and is. And he is. It's not just a monument. He's actually buried there. In fact, he's the only person buried within the CBD of Adelaide. In inside that square mile, apparently that is the story that is told. That's right. He and he's underneath a he's underneath a big monumental theodolite as well, in keeping with his surveyor career. I chose this spoon because I was feeling a bit sentimental about Adelaide. I went for a run yesterday. We're like we've got lockdown here because of COVID, so the streets are empty, but we're allowed to go for a run to exercise for ninety minutes a day. Yep. So I went for a run. And it was exhilarating. I went for a a run through the city and just went around and along the river and up around a a bunch of different places around the northern part of the CBD of the Central Business District of Adelaide. And I was just loving the city. And the fact that it was deserted in the middle of the day and there was like the sun was out, but it it was also raining. It was misty as well with the rain and stuff. And I felt it absolutely exhilarating just running along and enjoying the city and going, oh, this is great. And I was thinking... I love this city, like when I've got it all to myself. <laughs> so t- totally selfishly, like, yeah, this is it. Turn up the street, no one here, and there we go. So, One of my Colonel Light stories is when I used to work at the newspaper, we had like a daily cartoonist, you know, the guy that would do the cartoon of the day, and he was a real legend. Yep. He doesn't do it anymore, but his name was Michael Atchison, and he was a real legend, the daily Atchison cartoon in the Adelaide Advertiser. Oh, yeah. And he used to come and sit in the daily news meetings where we would talk about all the stories and just, like, make notes to himself and that. And then at the end of the day, he would supply this cartoon. He didn't really like having things suggested to him. He would just decide what he wanted to do. But one day, one of the stories I was doing, I had this idea for an Atchison cartoon to go with the story. And I went up to him and I said, Michael, I've got this idea. And I told him about it. And it involved Colonel Light, like a picture of the Colonel Light statue. He always did pictures of the Colonel Light statue. And I gave him this idea and I said, you know, do what you want with it. Anyway, he took up the idea and he did it and he used it the next day. And then he gave me his like original of it as well, an Atchison original that I had up on my desk at work from the time that I suggested the cartoon. Ah, that's nice. It's one of my pride and joy possessions. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. No idea where it is now. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) great spoon, great spoon. Uh, Now, another great spoon that one can obtain by being one of our Patreon supporters is the Unmade Podcast official souvenir spoon. We randomly choose a winner each episode. And today, a spoon has been sent off to John F. in Indiana, USA. John F., you have just won an Unmade Podcast spoon. Massive. How does it feel? Big congratulations. Let me be John F. Hang on, break the news to me like, like I'm listening. Say it again and I'll, I'll respond as if I'm John F. Hello, is is that John F. from Indiana there I'm speaking to? Uh, yes. Who's this? This is Brady from the Unmade Podcast. You probably don't remember, but you signed on to our Patreon uh, and give us money. <laughs> oh, I meant to cancel that. Damn it. Anyway, yes, what do you want? <laughs> well, before you do, can I just say you've won an Unmade Podcast souvenir spoon. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's incredible. It's true. It's true. Oh, my goodness. Gosh, gosh. 
You wouldn't believe it. I'm just here at the Olympics. I've just won a gold medal. But let me tell you, that is <laughs> massive news. That is amazing. That is incredible. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, well, it's good. It's, I'm really happy I've for you. Gold. I'm Look really happy for is. you. Put that gold medal there. I've won an unmade spoon. That's, <laughs> man, that's, that's incredible. That's, in, that's incredible. I can't believe it. Yeah. Thank you, Brady. And thank you, Tim, especially, the real host of the Unmade No, podcast. I'm sorry Tim couldn't be here to tell you as well, John, but he's got this terrible rash that's developed on the inside <laughs> of his upper leg and he's having it treated today, so... Oh, that... <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that's come back. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Tim again now, or are you like? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, that's. It. Yeah, I'll put John okay. down. Hang on, I'll just get out of character. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm back just out of character. Now. Yeah. So there's a there's another prize we give away. We have the unmade podcast collector cards that are based on spoons that have been featured on the show, and you can collect the whole set. We give away a handful every episode. By the way, a special hello to our friends at the uh, Australian Customs and Border Patrol forces. Because whenever I send some of these cards to Australia, they always seem to get opened up by the uh, customs people. Because whenever the recipient mm. gets them in Australia, there's always this little slip inside that says this was opened by the customs people. <laughs> so the people at customs must be coming very familiar with all these spoons. <laughs> That's right. oh, make sure you count the cards when they arrive, people. Just count the cards in case we need to talk to the yeah. customs. <laughs> the, there could be one listener there keep... waiting at the border and just going, oh, hello. <laughs> I'm desperate to find yeah. one. <laughs> Just intercepting them. I need a wall holler. Where is it? Oh, we're, they must. They, what must those customs people think when they open it and they see these collector cards with pictures of spoon? I guess they see all sorts of weird stuff. It's probably nothing to them. No. We are sending an envelope with a selection of cards to the following people. Stephen M. from Idaho. Anthony R. from California. Preben from Norway. Magnus S. also from Norway. Nathan O. from Wisconsin, Andrew A. from California, Meg G. from Alabama, Crystal from New Jersey, Scott F. from Wisconsin, and Jason V. B. from Washington, D.C. There's always a D.C. person in there. Well, lots of Americans. There's eight Americans and then a couple of Norwegians back to back. And a B. Obama from Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, go to patreon.com slash unmadefm, by the way, if you'd like to become a stakeholder and be in the running for all sorts of prizes and presents and stuff that we send out. I have my cards up on the spoon rack with the official spoon collection in our hallway. And I'm forever, when I walk past, stopping and taking a random card down and just reading it again, enjoying it and putting it back. I've, it's become <laughs> like I've got them all lined up with them. It's just marvellous. Yeah. We're getting close to the point where we might need to consider an expansion of the collection because we've had so many new spoons featured now. We'll have to get them all photographed and, like, expand the pack. Oh, no, they're all gone. I don't know where they are. <laughs> they're all... <laughs> <laughs> Most of them are here. I've got to send them to you, all the ones that have been sent in. Oh, yes, of course, yes. Sponsor time. Tim, what do you think of when I say the word story blocks? Uh... Story blocks. <laughs> no, you got me. I got nothing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Of course, I'm kidding. Oh, Tim, of course, jests. Our favourite sponsor, Story Blocks. They have over. I didn't realise it was this much. They have over one million pieces of royalty-free, high-quality video, audio, and images in their incredible library that you can use in your creations. That is Im impressive. By simply signing up for one of their subscription plans, which are very cost effective and, and cheap. You can use as much as you want. No more to pay, no tricky royalties that come back to bite you. It's like a huge buffet you can gorge yourself on. Lovely. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry, that just tickled my fancy. It's a buffet of f footage. Yeah. <laughs> And audio and images, that's great. Remember when Sizzler used to have those great buffets and they had that lovely cheesy bread and you could just have all you could eat? Oh, that bread was gold. Oh, that bread was great. That's that's what Storyblocks is like. It's like Sizzler <laughs> cheesy bread. That's how good it is. They should have called it Sizzler cheesy bread. I bet the name was probably taken, I guess. Mm. They're always increasing the amount of stuff they have in this fantastic library. They're also having a real push at the moment for more diverse and inclusive content. We've talked about that before. It's, a, it's another great thing. So go to storyblocks, 
dot com slash unmade storyblocks.com slash unmade whatever your budget whatever your needs they're going to have a plan that works for you check them out i use them almost every day it's a really important part of my work life storyblocks how many of the million do you think you've used oh good question i would say it's in the hundreds wow i'm now searching pictures of cheese after mentioning cheese rolling i don't know why i just wanted to look at pictures of cheese is that okay i like cheese i like cheese yeah Cheese is good. So if you were making like a video about cheese Mm. and you didn't have time or the budget to like make lots of incredible professional grade quality high resolution videos, you could just have a really cheap Storyblock subscription and use thousands of these pictures and videos in your creation. Do you see? Do you see the value of this product? So if you use the footage, let's say I made something entirely out of footage from Storyblocks. The creation's yours. You've licensed all that stuff, so you're free to use it. And your creation is still your creation, yeah. That's good. That's how. That's helpful. Have I not sufficiently explained Storyblocks to you over the last sort of year or so? No, yeah, I'm, I'm just... I'm just... I'm just... I'm just <laughs> Storyblocks.com slash unmade. Check them out. I've got loads of ideas, but I always use my most recent idea. I must stop doing that. I'm off. I'm often the same. Yes, it just feels better. It's called recency bias, I think. Ah. Anyway, my idea for a podcast is called "Things That Make You Go Woo." Right. And this is a podcast all about those little things in life, those little pleasures and joys that are so exciting to you that you're very likely to out loud go woo, woo, <laughs> woo. <laughs> things that make you go, woo. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I had it. One of the things that I get unduly excited about, even to this day, is when I'm driving and I go across <laughs> a really big bridge, like a suspension bridge that goes over the ocean or something, like those you know mm. mile-long bridges. There's a couple of them near my house. And yesterday I was driving from England to Wales. Across There's these two huge bridges that go across the Bristol Channel to Wales. They're massive. They're like, you know, like Golden Gate Bridge mm. type bridges. They are. Whenever you're driving over one, I just feel this desire to go, woo, I love being on a big bridge. This is cool. (laughs) (laughs) Another thing that gives me that feeling is when my wife, who's a very healthy eater and a very health conscious person, which by default means I have to be quite a healthy eater Mm. when she's around, when she says, why don't we have takeaway tonight? Oh. I go, (laughs) woo. I wasn't aware that it ever happened. I just I thought all your takeaway experiences were covert. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the third thing that I don't get to do enough, but just the thought of doing it makes me go woo, is going down a water slide. <laughs> <laughs> woo! <laughs> Who doesn't love going? We watch this TV show at the moment all the time called Below Deck, which is about this super yacht, life on a super yacht. Yeah. And all the time they set up for the clients this big inflatable water slide that goes off the side of the yacht and then all the clients go sliding down it into the sea. Every time I watch someone slide down it, internally I just go, woo, I want to go down that water slide. That's cool. The water slide is a creation that's purely for fun, isn't it? Like it's an inherently good idea who has... Which has no practical yeah. purpose except to make you go, woo. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> we had one at home, actually. We had a pool at home. I went and bought this um, inflatable water slide, which took ages to pump up. And then you had to put like yeah. water in the base so it didn't tip over and everything. And the kids would slide down it into the pool and you'd run up and dive onto it and slide down. Oh, it was so much fun. You know, I've just got one thing to say to that man. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> You know, your 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 woos are are really really excitable and addictive as well though, and like I you, remember, I think you do. I think you do a better woo than me. I'm a bit jealous of your woo. Really? Oh well. Yeah. Woo envy. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't aware that was a yeah. thing. But I remember yeah. you did one. <laughs> you did. We were driving home. We're in the car together, and we were driving home, and just about almost to the space where we were pulling up. In front of your house, and we went through a puddle in the car, and you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you went woo, woo, <laughs> yes, driving through puddles in cars, yes, driving through puddles in cars is the best. 
<laughs> so every time I, that stayed with that must be 25 years ago and that stayed with me so every time i drive through a puddle with the kids i go woo woo here we go, here we go. <laughs> and, now, and now they pick it up too even if it's we're going through as slow as ever because we're parking the car there's <laughs> yeah. there's a few woos around the place it's oh good. i love it i love it is there anything else that makes you go woo Oh, look, every now and then when you're in, in the car, in the car wash, that can be pretty cool. I don't oh, know it's a, yeah. It's more of a, <laughs> it's just like, it gets so exciting and terrifying as you remember it's going all over you. That's pretty cool. Car washes is one of those places where like you turn into a kid again and you remember what it was like being a kid in the back seat and being that mixture of, yeah, scared and amazed. Yeah. Oh, they're awesome. So that big thing comes down and you think it's going to consume the whole car. Mm. Yeah, Woo. is it going to break go. through? Like, how's it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh. things that make you go woo. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I also can't say that title without hearing the song "Things That Make You Go Hmm" in my uh, in my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Mm. That's good. C and C Music Factory. Is that right? I think that's yep. right. Love it. Woo! All right, good idea. A good idea makes you go woo. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what, a good idea that comes to you before you start recording the episode. That's a woo. Like it's like, all right, here we go. I got something good. I feel it. I feel it most weeks when I kind of crack the sermon and the line I'm going to take with my sermon for church. Like I feel it's yeah. great. You're planning something, you got an idea, and then it all comes together and you go, oh, that and that and that. Yes, yeah, no, that's the yeah, that's how it is. And I'm suddenly like, woo, here we go. This is great. Let's get. <laughs> so the shop is your own. Come and drop in on Halifax Street We have a sofa designed for you Choose your fabric, match your curtains too The sofa shop ain't gonna cost what you think it will Don't you do a thing until you see the sofa shop Sofa shop. Before we come to the really big sofa shop news that I'm promising, we're going to have some medium sofa shop news. (laughs) Moderate. People will be familiar by now with all these covers of the Sofa Shop advertising jingle that people have been sending in. And then we started getting ones done on these Carillon bell towers or crawl across America at all these American universities. We kept getting the Sofa Shop played on the bells of the Carillon. Was it Florida State University, Yale? And then there was uh, University of Texas as well. Anyway, I wanted to get in on the action and be part of this. So I got in touch with the British Carolyn Society, which uh, their, their, their boss, a guy called Scott Orr, the secretary of the society, and I said, I want the sofa shop played on a Carolyn in Britain. And he said, well, you've come to the right place. <laughs> and we, we met in a town in England, in Leicestershire, that's called Loughborough. And Loughborough has one of the most beautiful carillons in all of the uk it's in the center of the town in a place called queen's park there's a 152 foot high tower that's 46 meters and at the top are 47 bells that can be played on the on the keys the batons that that control a carillon and we went up there i went up there with scott and uh, a woman called carolyn sharp who is the the chief caroliner of loughborough her name's called Carolyn, is that right? Carolyn, yep, Carolyn Sharp, yes. Right. So anyway, yep. and she was lovely, and yes, she has heard the jokes. I imagine, and I'm sure she has, I was just clarifying. Anyway, here's a little recording of myself and Scott sitting at the controls of the Carolyn. That's the Carolyn, not Carolyn. Yes. Uh, at the controls of the Carolyn Bells. And ooh, here's what unfolded. We're about to, for the first time, have the sofa shop played in the UK. That's right, isn't it, Scott? Tell us, tell us about your interpretation and what you're going to do. The song inspired me, of course. I mean, it's, it's catchy. Um, yeah, just watched the original version, thought it would make a good thing to play on a carillon. Hopefully we'll do it justice. You've heard some of the other carillon versions. What, as, as the secretary of the British society, so, you know, pretty, pretty big voice in the carillon world, what did you think of their versions? Oh, I don't want to say anything, but, uh, you know, I, th- I think uh, the song is fast, it's exciting, and it should be played that way. So that's what I'm going to try and, try and hope to do. 
So you've indicated to me you're going to try and put a bit more, z a bit more pace, a bit Some more zing, more zing, more zing. It's always got to have more zing, right? All right. And what does that involve? Just doing the exact same thing but faster, or have you made changes? Basically that. All right. <laughs> All right, here we go then. Uh, we got all the recorders. Are you ready to rock and roll, James? This is a big moment. Yep. All right, here we go. Scott Orr playing the sofa shop on the Loughborough Carillon in Queen's Park. We should do it again. You want to do it again? I want to do it again. Can I sing along this time? Of, uh, I mean, uh, can I stop you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm try I'm worried I won't remember the words. All right. We'll find out, won't All we? Right. Ready? Yep. The sofa shop is your only stop for the sofa you need. The sofa shop, yeah, come and drop in on Halifax Street. That's very important. Sofa designed for you. Choose your fabric, match your curtains too. The sofa shop ain't gonna cost what you think it will. Don't you do a thing until you see the sofa shop. Wow. We totally destroyed that song. Yep. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Very good. Well, hopefully the recording upstairs sounds better. Thank you very much. Any 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 thoughts on how it went playing it? Like, you know, you want to reflect before people make their own comments? You know, there's always room to improve. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll come back. I, th I think it was all right. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for letting us bring the sofa shop to uh, British soil. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. All right. Great to have the inside explanation. And to be sitting right there, man, that's pretty cool. So just just for so people know, in addition to that short recording for the sofa shop, I actually did like a more elaborate video all about the Caroline and the tower and the history and how it all works. And that's gone onto my objectivity YouTube channel. So if you, I will put a link for that in the notes as well. So if you'd like to see a lot more information about how it all works and all behind the scenes and stuff, there's like a 10 minute video that, is well worth a look if you are interested in learning more about Carolyn's. Totally. Tim, you even you watched that video because I made you watch it. <laughs> I like your objectivity videos. That's that's for sure. They're all interesting. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. Oh, I, I've, I've been there for the recording of some of them, so I feel a you personal have, connection have. to them. But Yeah, no, this is interesting. Any more questions about the Loughborough Carolyn or you're happy? You Do, still across are there any Carolyn's? Like I noticed you were in this one right up the top. You walk up the top. And then you play and the bells are all up the top, right? Yeah. Whereas in my mind, first of all, with a carolin, is you walk in at the bottom. I don't know why I thought this. And you play it at the bottom and the... Like you would... Like that, that's where you'd stand if you were pulling a long rope. Well, even churches with, with bells at the top of church towers, the ropes are often, you know, up nearer to the bells. Yeah. Because the way yeah. a carolin works is you push the baton or the key and it's literally connected to a wire that pulls the you know, the dinger, the striker of the bell to make the bell go. So if the bells were at the top of this 50 metre high tower and you were pushing a bat on and you had 50 metres of wire yeah. going all the way to the top, that would probably cause a lot of problems and maintenance issues and stuff. So you want the keyboard, so to speak, to be as close to the bells as possible, I think. I don't know of Carolyn's that are based at ground level. There's no reason you couldn't have one, except I guess you want bells to be high so they can be heard Far and wide. I guess that's the whole purpose, yeah. It, the, the mechanics of it is exactly the same as a piano. Piano is just the same. You press a key and it moves this, which moves that yeah. wooden thing, and then it bangs. Yeah. A little hammer bangs down onto um, a wire. Yes. In this case, it's a bell instead of a wire, but yeah. It's marvellous to see it. Oh. And I love how the English inside these kind of mechanical, sort of you know, industrial-looking machines, they are, everything's always clean and painted bright red or bright green. I love how the English do that with their sort of industrial-era um, yeah. kind of 
mechanisms and stuff. There's such a steam engine kind of clean, red, shiny, <laughs> coloured <laughs> metals kind of country, aren't they? They are mm. nice. They are nice. The bells, the bells were very lovely. Anyway, go and have a look. Please do go and have a look. And our thanks to Scott, Carolyn, and everyone at the British Carolyn Society for helping make this possible. Now let's come to the big news about the sofa shop. As I said, and as you all know, we've had many, many covers of the sofa shop sent in to us and we feature them all the time and we will continue to feature them here on the show because we really appreciate it. But I thought it was time to sort of memorialise some of them and create something, create a keepsake. So Tim and I are very proud to announce the existence of a new product, which I have hundreds and hundreds of sitting here in a box in my office. <laughs> And that is the official Sofa Shop mixtape. Oh. An audio cassette of 48 <laughs> of our favourite covers available to own in ways that we have not yet decided. <laughs> Tim, do you think everyone knows what a mixtape is? Like, would your girls know what a mixtape is? I don't think they would. They would know it as a yeah. playlist, really. Yeah. They get what a playlist is. I've made them playlists. Te- explain what a mixtape is to our younger listeners who wouldn't have even experienced audio cassettes. Well, essentially it's a compilation of a bunch of songs that you give to someone. You make up a tape of some songs you think they'll like or that you like and want to share with them. Yeah. And you put them one after another on a cassette. The only thing is it's a lot harder than just dragging files over because... The old, in the days of cassettes, you would you would have to, you know, have two cassettes side by side and one song would play and yeah. you'd have to press record on the other one. So it would go over and then you'd yeah. click it stop at the when it finished and then move to another tape and then press record again and yeah. you'd have to time it all perfectly. And, yeah. and you'd even have to time, is this going to fit in before the tape ends? So, you know, the last song's always in oh. danger of being chopped in half. <laughs> I would also, and I'm sure you did this too, Sometimes I make make my own mixtapes of songs I liked recorded off the radio. So yes. you'd play the you'd have the radio playing, and then whenever a song came on you'd liked, you'd quickly press record and record it off the radio. And then when it stopped, you'd press stop, and you'd do this all through the day. So at the end of the day, you'd have a tape just of your favourite songs. But almost all of them had the start missing. Yes, and almost all of them had like a DJ talking over the end of them as well. Yes, yes. Oh, man, I had so many like that. And there are still songs today that I, when I hear it on the radio, uh, it feels, it sounds wrong because it it doesn't have some little, like, oh, yeah. problem with it. Like there's, you know, a little, like there's a rock set song that goes, it, like on one of my mixtapes, like <laughs> something yeah. went wrong. And the song sounds wrong yeah. on the radio not to have that in it because I listen to it. So oh, yeah. often like that. I, I, I feel strange if I listen to Touch Me by Samantha Fox and it hasn't got a DJ talking over the last 10 seconds of it. <laughs> or another song cuts in just at the end. Bang. It, yeah. One song leads into another <laughs> song straight away. I remember getting a, um, a new stereo for my birthday. I can't remember which birthday. Early teens somewhere. And being so excited that I was, it was laying next to my bed and it was just on this stand next to my bed. And I did that all night. I would just be laying there with my finger on record, ready to record a song that I liked because I was just yep. so excited yep. to be doing it on my new stereo. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I did the was, same thing. I love it. It's so funny to think music just seems so distant. And to cap the fact that it was coming for free through the radio, you just wanted to capture it and record it and, and hold on to it. And oh, I actually got a little bit sophisticated with my mixtapes that I, when I knew that there was just a a minute or 30 seconds or something like that towards the end of the side, instead of starting a new song that would be cut off halfway, I would just put some instrumental music on. So it would just be like, it would flow (laughs) instrumentally nicely to the end and then you'd start a fresh new song on on the second side. And I used to think that was pretty, that was some, some of my early mix work so here it is in my hand i'm opening it there we go get the plastic cover got the cassette oh that sound in my hand oh that's the sound of the tape we've got like oh we've got all branding on it and little insert and everything it's a very professional looking tape really proud of it we haven't exactly decided what to do with these yet how to get them out to the people stay tuned for that you can give us some ideas if you want um they're really cool we just don't 
haven't exactly decided what to do with it. Well, we could sell them or they could be a prize for a particular Patreon competition thing or, or patron gift. I don't know. The great cliche of mixtapes is that you give them to like a you you would give them to the girl you had a crush on. Yes. And say, you know, these are songs that remind me of you or <laughs> you just want to share your musical taste with them. The great so the cliche is the sad nerdy boy having made a mixtape for the girl and giving it to her and uh, did you ever give a mixtape to a girl? Oh, I can't remember if I did. I would sometimes play a song I liked down the phone to a girl I liked. Like, I do that sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, if yeah. You, you know, play it on your cassette player and then hold the bottom of the phone up against the player so she could hear it at the other end. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you just, like, SMS her a link so she could find herself on <laughs> Spotify? This was on an old rotary Bakelite phone. <laughs> <laughs> Always a poison chalice doing that though, of course, because then forever you're associated with that song. And so if there's heartbreak involved, oh gosh. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that, that, that artist has an asterisk next to them forever. Anyway, there we go. The Sofa Shop mixtape. There are pictures and videos and we'll, we'll, we'll share it and there'll be more news on that soon, but it exists. Very proud of it. You've got yours, haven't you? I've sent them to you already. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love them. Yep. I've put one in. I've got a few cassettes on my shelf. Yeah. Like of a, a favorite album and an important sermon to me that was important. A recording of Dad doing something and just a few. And I've I've slotted it in there, so it's made it into the little Hein Cannon. Very nice. No, nice. I love I love cassettes, but I love them bouncing around in the car as well. So that feeling of driving along and with one hand opening a cassette and sliding yeah. it into the cassette player. That's yep. I mean that's just goal. That feeling. Woo woo yes, <laughs> bang and then it comes on the music <laughs> and fast forwarding on the in the car. Don't want to hear this song. Woo. And over time, you would get so good with your cassette player, you would be at one with your cassette player that you could literally fast forward a song and stop at just the right moment to be at the start of the next song. You just had that feel for how long to hold down fast forward for. The timing. <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. Yeah. There it is. There. And of course, the cassette player chewing up your cassettes and having to wind them back in, wind the tape back in with a pencil. Another <laughs> great... Probably. Another lost art. <laughs> So getting a bit more modern, you remember a few episodes ago when we played some 8-bit versions of the Sofa Shop, which, by yes. the way, are included on the tape. Nice. Tim made a comment about how wouldn't it be cool to have a Sofa Shop video game, and a few people have actually started making Sofa Shop video games, and I'm gonna, I want to mention two. One came from Felix, and I'll include a link so you can go and play it. He said, Dear Brady and Tim, I did it! A demo version of the Sofa Shop game. I listened to episode 88 of the Unmade podcast and I could not resist. I work as a software engineer in Stockholm, Sweden, and I felt like I could whip something together during my free time after work this week. I hope you enjoy it. So anyway, I'll, I'll include a link. Tim and I have both played this. It's called The Sofa Chop. It's a great game. It's got this little Ugh. intro sequence that sets the scene with these cute little sofas talking to each other. I'll, I won't ruin it for you. You go and have a look, but there's there's music, Sofa Shop 8-bit music playing in the background and everything. It sets the scene beautifully. And then it's all about a customer comes in who wants to match their curtains and their sofa, as is the way in the Sofa Shop song. Choose your fabric, match your curtains too. And then they show you a colour of curtains, like, say, green curtains. And then all these sofas go flying across the screen. <laughs> And if they match, if the sofa's green, you have to let the sofa go. But if it doesn't match, you have to, like, chop it in half with your, with your computer mouse and slice it in <laughs> midair. It's really exciting. Were you oh, very good at it? <laughs> it's brilliant. I love the sounds and the feel and the look of it. Great. <laughs> sofa chop video game. Go and check out Felix's game. As I said, link in the notes... Uh, apparently it doesn't work on some browsers and you could download it and there's a whole bunch of technical stuff, but I'll let you people figure it out. You know better than us. Uh, and here's a second game. This one's called Escape the Sofa Shop. It comes from Adam in Cambridge. Tim and Brady, I recently discovered the Unmade podcast and have been catching up. Inspired by episode 88, I made a game. I think it's somewhat different from what you're picturing, but I've always had a soft spot for the text adventure games of the 80s when I was growing up. 
So he's made one of these text adventure games. You know, these ones, Tim, where it's most of it's writing and, you know, do you want to walk left into the room or do you want to pick up the spanner and the games like unfold like that? I think you yeah. were quite into these, didn't you? You used to design one of these in basic yeah, on Namestread, I, I, didn't you? I went through a, yeah, I did. I went through a phase of making them a little bit at school. So anyway, I've got Escape the Sofa Shop in front of me here, Tim. Do you want to play? Play it with me for a minute. Oh, okay. It says, you wake. The last few notes of the Sofa Shop jingle disappearing as the dream fades. The last thing you remember is that you were enjoying an afternoon looking for a new sofa and perhaps some matching curtains. Now you find yourself curled on a comfortable chair in the corner of the store you were looking around earlier. The sun appears to have gone down while you were asleep. The tinkle of a bell rings and you hear a door being closed and locked. How am I going to get out of here? In the emergency lighting, you can see that you are surrounded by sofas of various styles. You can see an (laughs) exit sign in the distance and the outline of a desk in the other direction. Are we going to... Head towards the exit or walk to the desk? Walk to the desk. Okay, I'm going to click on walk to the desk. This appears to be a customer service desk, but it's difficult to tell in this light. There is a small glowing switch on the wall here. Do you want to press the switch or go back to the sofa section? Press the switch. All right, I'm pressing it. The shop's lights all turn on, allowing you to see properly. You are at the customer service desk. A sign on the door behind the counter reads, staff only, and there is a waste paper basket under the counter. Here are our choices, Tim. Are we going to investigate the waste paper basket, look at the cash register, open the staff only door, head back to the sofa section, or head to the curtain section? Open the staff only door. What's your thinking there? Why do you want to do that? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. It just seems like an unlikely, like there could be something interesting behind there because it's not somewhere where anyone else can go. Let's open the staff only door. I'm pressing it. It says the door appears to be locked with a keypad with strange symbols on it. And then there's this big, there's a picture of the keypad with all these symbols like stars and flags and stuff. Oh, yeah. So we can press it. You can press all these buttons, but I guess we don't know what to press, do we? Return. So there's obviously a code we've got to get. It says return to the customer uh, service desk. All right. Okay, we're back at the customer service desk now. We can investigate the waste paper basket, look at the cash register, open staff only door, head to sofa section, head to curtain section. Investigate the waste paper basket then. I wonder if there's a code in there. It says here, you look through the contents of the waste paper basket. Most of it looks like old junk. There is a pair of old shorts and a crumpled up voucher. Do you want to take a voucher or take shorts? Are they Fanta shorts? Or are they just normal shorts? Should we click take shorts and find out? Yeah, let's find out right. about the shorts. I'm going to click take shorts. Looking more closely at the shorts, they appear to have Fanta on them. <laughs> <laughs> These look so good, they're worthy of being framed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm liking the in-jokes. There were lots of good in-jokes in uh, Felix's game as well. Uh, all right, let's mm. click take voucher. Yep. You take the voucher. It's for KFC. Why would anyone throw this away? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so now our options are look at the cash register, open the staff door, head to sofa section, head to curtain section. This is this is the closest people will get to actually being in the sofa shop. Like, it's I know. Like a it's amazing. It's amazing. As some, it's, it's really good. As you were walking, because I was in the actual sofa shop, right? Hmm. Oh, that's... That's what's in my mind's eye as you're walking me around the shop. I'm literally, <laughs> I just realised I'm visualising the actual sofa shop as it was. I'll tell you what, how about we leave it here? But We'll include a link to Escape the Sofa Shop. It's also at escapethesofashop.com if you want to check it out. And you can go and play this game and see if you can actually escape the sofa shop. Because I'm beginning to think Tim and I might not. <laughs> The longer time goes on, the more annoyed I am that I didn't buy a sofa from the sofa shop. It's a, it's a wrong you can't write. Because any price, it would have been a bargain with the legend, legendariness attached to it now. Oh, yeah. You could have walked out going, woo, woo, just bought a sofa from the sofa shop. <laughs> Blah, 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 blah.